Today's video is brought to you by Squarespace. When it comes down to creating an incredible anime, there's a lot of important factors that need to be factored. We need the anime to look good. The soundtrack has to bang. There has to be a cool couple of white haired characters for everybody to simp over. There's gotta be a big fight at the end. The main character needs to go from zero to hero. But maybe more importantly than any of that is the presence of an iconic anime group. Listen. Everybody loves a superhero team up. And in no place is that probably more true than anime. For every single Avengers assemble, there are 12 anime incredible group up moments. And while we've done entire videos ranking and explaining the best groups in anime, today we're gonna be focusing on one of those groups, specifically one of my favorite anime groups in existence. Because we're taking a step back into the world of Akame Ga Kill with today's video. All members of Night Raid Ranked and explained. See, Night Raid, for those of you who aren't well versed in all things that Kame got killed, probably because you're happier than me, is a group of assassins, political dissidents in the world of Akame got killed, who are rebelling against a fascist, tyrannical force known as the Empire. And no, not like the Star Wars Empire, but close, technically. And in the group of Night Raid, which goes through a couple of different iterations, there are 10 total members, all of which wield legendary items known as Imperial Arms, most of which we talked about in the first. First, the Kami Got Kill video we did, the top 10 Imperial Arms ranked and explained. But today we're going to be talking about the users of those Imperial Arms, Night Raid. Even though a large amount of the Imperial Arms we talked about are used by the Empire, but that's neither here nor there. But before we get to ranking or explaining anything, guys, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. And while you guys are at it, go ahead and follow my anime podcast called Utaku's Anonymous that I do every week with Danny Mata, where we break down everything that happened in anime this week. It's available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. So before we get into all that, guys, today we gotta talk about our favorite reoccurring sponsor to the page, Squarespace. Squarespace is your one-stop shopping opportunity to build the website of your dreams. Whether that website be for a brand, a page, or a business, there is no better space than Squarespace. This could be a website selling anime merch, food, or custom stickers, it doesn't matter. There's no better place to get started than Squarespace. But I know what you're saying. You're saying, Nick, I don't have a degree in website design. I can't just sit down and make the website of my dreams. But Squarespace makes the building process not only intuitive, but incredibly easy. And building this beautiful website will not only make it easier to engage with your customers or fans, but also sell your product. And one of the tools that makes your life a heck of a whole lot easier are member areas. A tool that allows you to put content content or products behind a paywall. And only those who pay for access to those specific areas get access to that content or product, which can create an entirely new revenue stream for people like me. And speaking of things that Squarespace has that help people like me, they also offer one of the most intuitive video content creation tools on the market, which allows you without even leaving your Squarespace website to make clickable and engaging videos for your audience. An audience that you can keep track of using the analytical tools that Squarespace provides. And these analytics don't only tell you how your business is doing, but how to improve your business as you're able to find Find out where site visits or sales are coming from, which can give you insight into where you need to spend your time advertising. And when you're ready to launch that perfect website, go to squarespace.com slash weebcommander for 10% off your website or domain. So what are you guys waiting for? Get out there and build the brand that you know you can. So Night Raid, a group of freedom fighters rallying against a powerful empire trying to suppress the will of anybody who's not royalty. A fascist bloated system filled with war criminals keeping the populace suppressed. And while every single character in this group fights for the same cause, they all fight in very different ways. With some characters focusing on reconnaissance, while other characters focus on turning into massive beasts that can destroy anything. And such is the beauty of Imperial Arms. Well, originally 48 Imperial Arms were created by the first king of the empire, who commissioned scientists and mechanics from all over the world to help build these legendary weapons. And this first king of the empire wanted to use these legendary weapons to remain in control control of his nation and expand his nation for years to come. But as hundreds of years as war marched forward, these Imperial Arms slowly but surely were destroyed, making them not only a commodity, but rarer by the year. But their age and their rarity does not take away from their power. And without their power, Night Raid wouldn't be nearly as powerful a force as it currently is. But amongst this legendary group, who is the most powerful? What is their backstory and what weapon do they wield? Well, we're going to answer all those questions and more, but before we do, we're gonna have to start this video off in the way that we tend to start these videos off at the beginning, but in this case, 10th place. And coming in at our number 10 spot is somewhat ironically the leader of Night Raid, 
Najida. See, Najida actually used to be a general for the Empire before she defected. This was after there was an expedition led by her in Esdeath to wipe out the Bond tribe. Fed up with the way that the Empire was treating the world, Najida decided to defect to the Revolutionary Army, where eventually she was put in charge of an assassination group, which was an offset of the Revolutionary Army, Night Raid. However, unfortunately, when you defect from the army of the Empire, especially when Esdeath is the person who's working right next to you, getting away isn't so easy. And so when Najida told all of her soldiers in the Empire that she was going to be defecting to the Revolutionary Army, as her and her soldiers defected, Esdeath caught wind. And eventually, Esdeath caught up with Najida. And in the short but relatively eventful battle that took place between the two of them, Esdeath took Najida's right eye and right arm. Now, originally, the only person that Najida had with her was Lubbock, who served under her in the Empire. But as time went on, Najida acquired more people, like Bulat and Incursia, and eventually Akame and her one-cut kill Katana. However, unfortunately, because of Najida's injuries, recruitment is basically all she can do. See, at one point in time, Najida did technically wield Pumpkin. However, in the initial battle against Akame, when Najida and Bulat came across her, Najida found that she was unable to hit Akame with Pumpkin, and after that battle, realized that Pumpkin would be better suited in the hands of Mine. Now, the reason that she probably got rid of Mine is because she admittedly states that after her battle against Esdeath, she's only at 40% of her original power. And since Pumpkin's power scales directly to how much emotion and power you can put into Pumpkin as the wheel, her, Najida realizing that mine, who was healthy and strong and very emotional, was the better choice, was a clear cut good choice. But Najida only being at 40% of her original power is kind of scary because we've seen from Najida that with the power of her prosthetic arm, she's still able to punch heads clean off, which is mostly based off her ability to fire her prosthetic arm and reel it back in. And by using the momentum of pulling herself towards her arm, she's able to give her kicks or her punches more momentum. Now, if we were considering Empire Najida, who had pumpkin she would be substantially higher on this list probably top three but really the only thing we ever see from Najida in terms of power is eventually she becomes the master of Susano however being the master for a humanoid imperial arm really doesn't take all that much work and it's kind of hard to associate Susano's power with hers considering the fact that he is basically a person really the only thing that Najida does as it pertains to Susano is supplying him with power for his trump card which she's able to do three times now she also provides some long distance assistance for Susano every once in a while while flying on the back of her flying mantis. The long distance support for your biological Imperial arm isn't going to put you that high on the night raid list. But that being said, she does make it to the end of the manga. So I don't know, maybe she was doing something correct. But enough about the leader. Let's get to the subordinates because coming in at number nine, we have Shelley. Shelley is one of the first characters we're introduced to in Akame Got Kill. Well, at least one of the first characters we're introduced to in Night Raid. Shelley wields the Imperial arm arm Extase, which is a giant set of scissors said to be capable of cutting through anything in the world. Shele grew up in the lowest parts of the Empire, where her naturally clumsy nature made people believe that she was useless. However, Shele did have one friend who didn't mind Shele's aloof and clumsy nature. However, that didn't last for long as Shele's current, at least then current boyfriend, attacked her best friend. And in order to protect her best friend, Shele killed that boyfriend, realizing in that moment that she had an extraordinary talent for murder, which her best friend didn't love to see, and thus the friendship was broken. But that's not where the tragedy ended for Shelley. Not only did she lose her friend and her boyfriend that day, her boyfriend belonged to a gang who came looking for the person who murdered him. But instead, they got murdered by the purple-haired girl who realized that she was good at killing. It was after that moment that the Revolutionary Army was like, well, we need people who are talented at killing and therefore recruited her. Now, like we've already stated, Shelley wielded the Imperial Arms Extase, also known as Cutter of Creation Extase. Now, the passive ability of this Imperial Arm is that it can cut through anything, iron, steel, people, other Imperial Arms, everything. However, this Imperial Arm, like every other Imperial Arm out there, has a trump card. Now, unfortunately, Extase's isn't anything all that impressive. It just allows Extase to create a blinding light that allows the wielder of the Imperial Arm to retreat or stun their opponent. So, so far as Imperial Arms go, it's definitely not the strongest. But Shelley definitely is one of the stronger people in Night Raid. As we saw in her battle against Seryu, that even though she's naturally clumsy, when she's fighting, 
She is not. She is agile, dexterous, and has near instantaneous reaction. Being able to deflect gunshots from Seiryu and even react to Koro's instantaneous and surprise attack. But unfortunately, because of the weakness of her Imperial arm, it's hard to put her high on this list, as pretty much everybody else on this list has a better Imperial arm. Like our number eight spot, Chelsea. Now listen, I know what you're gonna say. Chelsea's Imperial arm isn't better than Ekstase. And sure, if you're just considering the attack power potential of Ekstase and Gaia Foundation, then of course Ekstase is gonna be more powerful. But when it comes to being a member of an assassination group, sometimes versatility and stealth are more important than being able to cut through anything. Now, Chelsea was brought into Night Raid alongside Susano. See, after Night Raid had taken some relatively heavy losses, Najida goes to the Revolutionary Army looking for replacements, and Chelsea is one of them. Now, Chelsea, like a lot of characters in Night Raid, also at one point served the Empire, working under an incredibly cruel Viceroy who took pleasure out of hunting people. This led Chelsea to become an incredibly nihilistic person who really saw no meaning in life. That is, of course, until she stumbled upon Gaia Foundation, which is an Imperial arm that allows you to apply makeup up to yourself that makes you look like whoever you want to be. Doesn't matter the difference in height, weight, stature, anything, you can be anybody so long as you know what they look like. Now, the reason that Gaia Foundation had been put away is because no suitable owner had been found for it. A big part of Imperial Arm usage is finding somebody who's able to synchronize with it. However, Chelsea was able to synchronize with Gaia Foundation, and she used Gaia Foundation to kill the Viceroy she worked under. Almost immediately after she killed this Viceroy, he was replaced by an incredibly kind-hearted man. And it was at this point that Chelsea realized that with the usage of Gaia Foundation, she could help, which led her to joining the Revolutionary Army. Now, Chelsea's road to becoming a member of Night Raid is long and arduous. When she first joined the Revolutionary Army, she came under the tutelage of a woman by the name of Barbara. And her, Barbara, and another one of Barbara's disciple, Tycho, were tasked with the task of assassinating Imperial assassins. However, unfortunately, both Barbara and Tycho were killed by Akame and Gozuki, who are both members of the Empire's Elite Seven, the team that Akame and her sister served on. And after a raid on the Elite Seven that led to losses on both sides, Besides, Chelsea joined Night Raid's away team, a team separate from the main body of Night Raid that still took part in assassinations against the Empire. And for a long time, Chelsea was an incredible assassin, because with the power of her Gaia Foundation, she could take the form of anybody from Susano to a Panther Cub. And while people might write her off because her Imperial Arm isn't a combat type, Nanjita states that Chelsea has completed just as many assassinations as a Kame. Now, the way that Chelsea would usually do her assassinations is that she would dress up like somebody you knew and then stab you with a a poisoned needle. And usually that was enough to kill people. And unfortunately, that's Chelsea's biggest weakness. Because a poison needle is enough to kill most people, Chelsea never really had to develop her combat skills. And therefore, when she finds herself up against somebody who a poison needle isn't enough for, she's kind of out of options, which is why she sits at number eight on this list. But what if you had an Imperial arm that was both a support type and a combat type? Well, that's something that very much applies to our number seven entry on this list, Lubbock. See, Lubbock actually hails from a wealthy merchant family from the Empire. And in the Empire is where he met Najida, a woman he fell in love with upon first sight. He fell so deeply in love with Najida that he actually threw away his life as a wealthy son of a merchant family to join the army to follow her. And he used his talents as a soldier to rise through the ranks of the army so he could serve right beside her. Even going so far as to defect right alongside with her when she decided she no longer wanted anything to do with the Empire. Now, Lubbock wields the Imperial Arm, infinite Infinite Uses Crosstail, which, just like its name, has a ton of different uses. See, Infinite Uses Crosstail is just a spool of incredibly powerful wire that can be used for as many uses as wire can be used for. And therefore, the power of this Imperial Arm is actually entirely up to the user and their creativity. And fortunately for Lubbock, he's very creative. See, Lubbock is incredibly resourceful and often plans multiple moves in advance. This is how Lubbock was able to kill two out of the four Rakasa's demons by himself, which was a group noted for their ability to kill weird wielders of Imperial Arms. Lubbock was incredibly good at tricking his enemies or deceiving them at key moments, going so far as to, on multiple different occasions, fake his own death in order to get enemies to believe he was out of the picture. But faking your own death as one of your key traits isn't going to put you that high on the power rankings, which is why coming in at number six, we have Bulat. Now, ironically, one of the better representations of a gay man.
man in anime period. Bulat, also known as Hundred Man Slayer Bulat, is one of the original wielders of Incursio we ever see. Bulat, just like so many other members of Night Raid, was originally a soldier in the Empire, soldiering under a man by the name of Gensei, a man known as the strongest soldier of his time. And it was actually in the Empire that Bulat would gain his name, the Hundred Man Slayer. However, one day when the general Bulat served under General Liver decided to not go along with the Prime Minister's agenda, General Liver was framed for doing something he didn't do. And Bulat, having an immense amount of pride and trust in General Liver, saw the true colors of the Empire, a totalitarian dictatorship that would paint great men in terrible colors if only to further their cause. And thus, Bulat decided to leave the Empire and join the Revolutionary Army. And thus, Bulat becomes one of the first members of Night Raid, and even finds himself battling against the likes of Akame, who's unable to cut through Incursio, and therefore they find themselves in a stalemate. See, Bulat's Imperial Arm was Incursio, which is one of the strongest Imperial Arms in the entire universe. See, Incursio was created out of a super-class Danger Beast, and is an armor-type Imperial Arm that takes the form of a sword and chain when not activate. However, the Danger Beast used to create Incursio was so powerful, it still lives within the armor. Now I know what you're saying. You're saying, Nick, how could Bulat, the man who was able to fight on equal terms with Akame, somebody who was going to be very close to the top of this list, be so low? Especially when he was the wielder of Incursio, one of the strongest Imperial arms out there. Well, Incursio's strongest aspect is its ability to evolve. And while Bulat was the wielder of Incursio, we never once saw it evolve. But this doesn't mean that Bulat isn't incredibly powerful. He is. In fact, when Tatsumi and Bulat were sent on a mission together and they came up against the three beasts, three incredibly powerful members of the Empire who all wielded Imperial Arms, all three of the three beasts were cut down. And mind you, at this current moment, Tatsumi didn't have an Imperial Arm. See, Bulat, when he manifests in Curcio, also manifests a spear. A spear that he is incredibly versatile and deadly with. And with the power of his spearmanship, he's able to to take on multiple powerful enemies at once, like the three beasts. Not to mention that Bulat's strength and endurance are probably some of the highest in all of Night Raid, as he was not only able to take multiple hits from General Liver's Imperial Arm, that allows him to control his blood and shoot it at such a high velocity that it was able to pierce through Incursio, and even after taking the damage inflicted by this Imperial Arm, still best his formal general in a sword fight. And like we've already stated, he was able to battle Akame to a standstill, with her later admitting that if the battle had come to a conclusion, she would have lost. And mind you, at this point in time, Akame was considered the Empire's strongest assassin. On top of this, as somebody who had mastered the Incursio Imperial Arm, Bulat was also able to use its special ability invisibility, which allowed Bulat to turn invisible for a limited amount of time. However, sometimes the best armor in life is no armor at all. Because coming in in number five, we have maybe quite controversially here, Leone. Leone is one of the oldest and most tenured members of Night Raid. And while Leone's roles usually boil down to reconnaissance and gathering of information, when it comes to a brawl, there's very few who can go one-on-one -on -one with her. Leone grew up in the toughest part of the capital, where she was forced to work in a massage parlor at the age of way too young, and she was recruited into the Revolutionary Army when she saved some children from the same slums that she was from. Her backstory is a lot less convoluted than a lot of others. Now, Leone does kind of embody the big sister role on Night Raid, and honestly, I wasn't complaining, but outside of her big sister persona, Leone also has some big power. See, Leone wielded an Imperial arm known as Lionel, and Lionel basically just acts as a passive boost to anything that Leone does. It boosts her speed, strength, reflexes, and regeneration. Yes, that's right. With the power of Lionel, Leone has the ability to regenerate wounds and not just simple bruises or scratches, grievous, borderline fatal wounds. And the regeneration granted by Lionel can actually be brought up to an even higher level because the trump card of Lionel is something known as Regenerator, which grants the user a level of almost instantaneous regeneration, which allows Leone to recover from a removed eye in multiple deep slashes. And if, let's say, hypothetically, Leone loses in arm. Lovett can use Crosstail to reconnect that arm to her, and she could regenerate that arm's connection to her body. On top of all of this, Leone's regeneration ability is actually amped if she eats other animals, and we saw a good example of this in her battle against Dorothea. Tie this into the fact that Leone is probably the most talented hand-to-hand -hand fighter in all of Akame Ga Kill, and you have a scary mix. But Leone often didn't even have to resort to her hand-to-hand -hand combat, because her animal-like characteristics granted to her by Lionel actually made her incredible 
incredible at stealth, which meant the majority of the assassination missions that she was sent on, she was able to kill the person before they could even react. And when you're a person able to kill three men with a single blow or a large danger beast with a single blow, having a little bit of stealth on your side is a big plus. And speed wise, Leone is able to keep up with Tatsumi while he was using his Incursio transformation. She was able to tank lightning bolts from Budo and get back up. On top of this, her animal like instincts basically give her a sixth sense for danger. And not to mention, she also gets a super form that amps all of her existing amped abilities when she fuses with Lionel, making her the strongest form of what was already a very strong character, but not as strong as a Sundere with a cannon. Because coming in at number four, we have Mine. Mine, while one of the worst characters in the beginning days of a Kamiga kill, slowly but surely becomes everybody's favorite girl. And as she emerges as the clear and only choice for Tatsumi as it pertains to a love option, we can't help but fall for just how mean she used to be. Mine was born in the western borders of the Empire and spent the majority of her childhood under incredible ridicule because of her half foreign blood, where she gets the pink hair from. And thus Mine decides to join the Revolutionary Army when she hears that the Revolutionary army is trying to make alliances with western nations in hopes that one day when the revolutionary army wins and unify with western nations that prejudice towards those with western blood will be lessened and that mine's children who will have her western blood won't go through the same level of discrimination that she went through which is going to be hard when you consider the fact in the manga that mine's children are half dragon. It's a lot to explain. I'm not getting into it. Now, mine's power comes from her Imperial arm, Pumpkin, which was given to her by Najida, who realized she could no longer use it at the full capacity she used to be able to. Now, Pumpkin is a rifle Imperial arms that has the ability to shoot in three different ways. That being sniper, machine gun, or long barrel, with long barrel essentially being a cannon. However, Pumpkin doesn't fire bullets. Pumpkin fires spiritual energy, spiritual energy that's a reflection of how much danger the user is in. So the more danger the user is in, the more powerful the weapon is. However, apparently when you're firing emotional bullets, you have to make sure you don't overheat. But when it comes down to it, there's very few Imperial Arms that are as customizable as Pumpkin. See, Pumpkin's firing modes are changed depending on what attachments you have on it. But there appears to be different things you can do outside of sniper, multi-shot, and a long barrel. As we all see in mind, use Pumpkin to slash with emotional energy. Kind of like Marcus in Gears of War with his chain Chainsaw gun. Now, obviously, as this is a rifle Imperial Arms, mine has to be a sniper. Getting a bunch of danger and emotional energy fed into Pumpkin and then missing your shot not only puts you in danger, which I guess is technically good for the wielder of Pumpkin, but also shortens the clock until your gun overheats. And therefore, there's actually an eyepiece that's detachable from Pumpkin that mine can wear that allows her to scout distance and snipe accurately. However, when it comes down to it, mine is more powerful than just Pumpkin. As we've seen, mine spar in hand to hand combat with a comet. Well, the power of Pumpkin's trump card, hand-to-hand -hand combat, doesn't really have to ever be an option. See, the way that Mine is able to slash with Pumpkin is actually through her trump card, which is known as High Output Blast Blade, which allows Mine to fire a blast so intense that it operates as a giant blade, slicing through anything it touches. Though the problem with this technique is that it immediately overheats Pumpkin. However, since Mine does take incredible care of Pumpkin, she's eventually able to use this trump card multiple times in a row, which makes her and Pumpkin some of the strongest people in the universe, with her only discernible weakness being the fact that she constantly leaves her back open to counterattack. But Mine actually does this on purpose in order to put herself in more danger, because the more danger she's in, the stronger she is. But since we're talking about Imperial Arms, let's talk about an Imperial Arm, but a biological one, because coming up at number three, we have Susano. Susano isn't a person. He's a biological Imperial Arm who was brought to Night Raid under the mission of Najida. And outside of being one of the most powerful Imperial arms in existence, he's also Night Raid's housekeeper and cook. Now, his real name is Speed of Lightning Susano, and he's roughly 1,000 years old because that's how long ago Imperial arms were created. Now, Susano is a perfectionist who's obsessed with keeping everything tidy and symmetric. And while technically he isn't a human, as time progresses, he eventually makes friends with members of Night Raid. And the first real time we ever see Susano step to the plate is in his battle against Dr. Stylish, where it was revealed to us that Susano wasn't actually a human, but a humanoid Imperial Arm, as we saw him not only unaffected by Dr. Stylish's poison attack, but also recover from what should have
have been fatal wounds as Dr. Stylish's explosive minions, well, exploded on him. Now, technically, Susano hasn't been running around for a thousand years fighting in battles. He's been inactive for a certain amount of time, it's never stated. However, he reactivates because Najida looks like the person who used to command him, who was a great general. Therefore, Susano allowed himself to synchronize with Najida. But Susano has more impressive feats than just battling against Dr. Stylish. Inarguably, Susano's most impressive feat is his battle against Ezdef. See, after the assassination attempt on Bolik by Night Raid, Night Raid had to retreat. However, somebody needed to stall Ezdef, which is what Susano elected to do. Now, because Susano is a biological Imperial arm, he doesn't have a heart. He has a core. And without his core being destroyed, he could never die, being granted essentially infinite regeneration. On top of this, as he wasn't a human and therefore didn't have a respiratory system, things like poison and toxins couldn't work on him. Now, when it came to combat, Susano wielded a wolf fang mace. Essentially kind of like those things that you see the army guys battling with, but imagine blades come out of them. Now with just the power of being in Imperial Arms and having his wolf fang mace, Susano has pulled off some insane stuff. Like when he battled against Kurome's ultra class danger beast, Destagul and came out victorious. Now, mind you, Ultra Class Danger Beast is as high as a classification on Danger Beasts gets, holding the same distinction as the Danger Beast that was used to create Incursio. And that's without even considering his trump card, which is known as Magatama Manifestation. By absorbing power from the person who was controlling him, in this case, Nanjina, Susano was able to acquire a more powerful armored form. And in this more powerful armored form, he's able to use three abilities he couldn't use previously. Yata no Kagami, also known as Kagami Mirror, that allowed him to deflect all incoming projectiles. Ame no Murakumo, which is an incredibly long transparent blade that allows him to cut through basically anything, including as death's ice walls. And Yasukani no Magatama, which allowed Susano to increase his speed and strength. Now in this form, Susano is pretty much an even match for Ezdeath. In fact, in this battle against Ezdeath, where Susano was simply trying to stall her so the rest of Night Raid could get away, he forced Ezdeath to use her Imperial Arms trump card that allows her to free time, something that no person prior to Susano had ever forced her to do, and something she wouldn't have to do again until battling against the likes of Akame. And when he can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the biggest, baddest bad guy in the entire universe and make them use their strongest move, well, that's going to get you pretty high on this list. But not as high as the love interest of the biggest, baddest bad guy in the entire universe, because coming in at a number two spot, we have Tatsumi. Now, Tatsumi isn't the main character of the manga, but he's the main character of the manga. I mean, it is called Akame Got Kill, but like, is it really about Akame? Tatsumi's story starts when him and two of his friends set out from their village to make money to earn to send back to their village. Now, unfortunately, Tatsumi gets split up from his two friends. And then Tatsumi gets conned out of all of his money by a woman saying that she'll introduce him to certain military higher-ups for a cost. Then, after being conned out of all of his money, is walking around the streets looking for a place to stay when he meets a woman by the name of Arya, who invites him to stay at her house, where it's nice and safe and warm. And it's while at this house he learns about the corruption of the Empire and how the Prime Minister is at the center of it all. But that very night, Night Raid decides to attack Arya's mansion, killing pretty much everybody. And as Tatsumi runs to Arya to protect her, this woman who had brought him in from the dark and the cold, it's actually revealed that Arya had been abducting vagrants from cities to torture in her storehouse. And amongst the people that she captured, were Tatsumi's two village friends. So Tatsumi cuts down Arya and decides to join Night Raid. What a fun childhood story. And while a lot of people would say that Tatsumi's power comes from Incursio, Tatsumi was powerful long before Incursio. Obviously, when Tatsumi joins Night Raid, he begins to train with the likes of Lubbock and Bulat and Akame, and that makes him more powerful. But before Tatsumi even got to Arya's house, he cut down an Earth Dragon Danger Beast with next to no effort. His first mission with Night Raid is to cut down a man by the name of Ogre, who is the chief of police in the Capital. In fact, he used to be Seiryu's superior. And Tatsumi cuts him down with no Incursio. Tatsumi without Incursio even holds his own against Zonku the Beheader for a little bit until he begins to use his Imperial Arms, Spectator, that essentially gives him foresight to actually get an upper hand. Tatsumi even goes on to kill the Kabori brothers with Leone without Incursio. But obviously, Tatsumi's true strength does come from Incursio. But that doesn't take away from the fact that in the first episode, he was able to last longer against Akame 
Beyblade than most people. He was able to defeat Niao, a wielder of an Imperial Arms, and one of the three demons without an Imperial Arm of his own. And finally, after this battle against Niao, he inherits Incursio. And as Incursio had to adapt from Bulat to Tatsumi, Tatsumi forced Incursio to evolve to match his body. And after one month with Incursio, it stated that Tatsumi is approaching Bulat's level of strength and mastery over the Imperial Arm. In fact, in the tournament held by Ez Death, Tatsumi is so powerful he catches her eye, as he's able to defeat a member of the Temple of the Imperial Fist. But Tatsumi's training with Incursio doesn't just make him stronger while using Incursio. Obviously, while he's using Incursio, he's able to shatter boulders multiple times his size. But when he doesn't have Incursio activated, he's still able to lift a danger beast the size of a bear over his head after killing it. And Tatsumi would only get stronger with Incursio as he forced it to evolve multiple times over through the strength of his emotions. And this is the power of Incursio, adaptability. And this adaptability allowed Tatsumi to fight on par with both Budo and Ezdeath, the leaders of the Imperial Army. Now, this is mostly due to the fact that Incursio gained a resistance to ice and lightning attacks, which both Ezdeath and Budo use, respectively. In fact, Incursio's resistance to ice-based attacks is so high that it's able to resist Ezdeath's trump card, which freezes time itself. And when Tatsumi and Budo fight against each other, Tatsumi is the first person to ever land a clean blow on Budo. However, as Tatsumi continued evolving Incursio, Incursio began to bind to his body, to the point where Tatsumi began to look more and more like the danger beast used to create Incursio, Tyrant, than himself. However, since Tyrant was also immune to poison, Tatsumi also became immune to poison, as we saw that he was immune to the poison trap left by the Prime Minister that was said to be able to kill a high-class danger beast in an instant. But this isn't where the evolution of Incursio stopped. In Tatsumi's battle against one of the strongest, if not the strongest Imperial arm in all of Akame Ga Kills, Shiko Taser, he forced Incursio to evolve once again, allowing him to destroy a 1,500 foot tall Imperial arm in two hits. And now in the manga, he's a dragon forever. And they have kids that are dragons and have pink hair. Oh my God, that's Milliam. But even that doesn't make Tatsumi as strong as our number one entry on this list because the number one entry on this list has the manga named after her, Akame from Akame Ga Kill. See, Akame, also known as Akame of the Demon Sword Murasame, started off her story as the Empire's strongest assassin. Well, technically she started off her story by her and her sister Kurome being sold to the Empire by her parents. After which the Empire forced her and her sister to go through a cruel exam where they were forced to live in a forest overrun with danger beasts. And out of the 100 children forced into this forest, Kurome and Akame were one of the very few to survive. And though they both survived this this test, Gazuki, the current wielder of the Elite Seven, said they both couldn't join their squad because as they were sisters, they would depend on each other and depending on somebody in the line of assassination isn't the move. And thus Akame, as the more powerful of the two, was accepted into the Elite Seven and quickly became one of the greatest assassins in the Empire's history. Akame was then given something known as a Shingu, which were weapons created by an emperor 400 years ago that were supposed to surpass the Imperial Arms. And the Shingu that Akame was given was a sword whose cuts could not be healed. Akame then goes on countless assassination missions with the Elite Seven, killing hundreds of political enemies of the Empire. But the last one she was ever sent to kill being General Nanjida. See, Akame had been long dissatisfied with the Empire, and when she found herself against General Nanjida and Bulat, she decided it was time to defect. However, after Akame decided to leave the Empire, Kurome, her sister, took over her spot in the Elite Seven, which started a long and very arduous rivalry between the two of them. See, Akame has tons of very impressive feats in Night Raid. Well, see, when Tatsumi was clearly failing to cut down Zonku the Beheader because of the use of his Imperial Arm, Akame was able to easily step in and overwhelm his foresight by moving so fast that even seeing the future didn't help him. Even when Akame is faced against an opponent like Tobi, who was part of Dr. Stylish's team, who was technically a cyborg and therefore her one cut katana's poison wouldn't work on him, simply decided to beat him by slicing him up into as many pieces as she possibly could. But by far and away, Akame's most impressive feats are her battles against her sister, 
in Esdef. See, Akame, after Night Raid's battle against Budo, finds herself in combat against her sister, Kuromi, who wields the Imperial Arm, Yatsufusa, which allows her to reincarnate people she's killed and control them as puppets, allowing her to control up to eight people or danger beasts simultaneously. And while technically Akame doesn't defeat Kuromi, because Kuromi is whisked away by wave and they defect from the Empire, Kuromi was the new strongest person in the Elite Seven, maybe outside of Wave. Kame being able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe against her with Yatsufusa, one of the strongest Imperial arms in the entire universe, is a very impressive feat, but not nearly as impressive as Akame's battle against Esdeath. See, while in the beginning stages of Akame's battle against Esdeath, it appeared as though Esdeath had the upper hand, it became apparent through the course of their battle that not only could Akame go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Esdeath, she could defeat her. Now, obviously, this had a lot to do with Akame's Imperial Arm, Murasame, which had the ability to kill anybody it slashed once, thus giving it the name, the One Cut Kill Sword. However, the poison inflicted by Murasame does take a second to take over the body. And thus, when Akame is able to slash one of Ezdeath's arm with her blade, Ezdeath simply cuts off her own arm. But outside of Murasame, Akame is arguably one of the most talented sword users in all of Akame Got Kill, with her sword blade being better than the likes of Tatsumi or Bulat or even Ezdeath. Tie that into the fact that Wave once stated that Akame is able to travel at Mach 1, 340 meters per second, and you have a very dangerous lady, but a lady made more dangerous by Murasame's trump card, which allows Akame to slash herself with Murasame and use the power of the poison to strengthen her body. A boost in power and strength that allowed Akame to overpower as Death's Time Stop trump card and come out victorious against arguably the strongest person in Akame Got Kill's universe and bring the anime of Akame Got Kill to a close. And with that, that's everything that you need to know about the members of Night Raid. Now, obviously, there's the manga Akame Got Kill Zero, which goes over Akame's days as an assassin for the Empire, and then obviously the sequel to Akame Got Kill Hinowaga Yuku. But we're not gonna go over those because I haven't read them in years. But tell me, guys, do you agree with my ranking of Night Raid? Did I miss anything? Tell me in the comments below and why you guys are down there, please, for me. Like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. Now that I've ranked and explained every member of Night Raid, I feel as though there's a lot of groups I could probably rank and explain that I just haven't done yet.